Hey, this is Matt and Chris at the Quantum Leap Podcast, and we've got a really special feature for you today. We have not one, but two co-executive producers from Quantum Leap with us. Uh, we've got Benjamin Rabb and Derek A. Hughes. Benjamin, Derek, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Uh, so this is the first time we've had you on the show. Uh, you've, you've obviously been with the series since the start. We have so much to catch up on. I know, obviously, we really want to spend some time talking about this week's episode, uh, but it, I think it would be remiss of us if we didn't just have a very quick look back at, at how things have been over the last year. So can I just start by asking you how you got involved in the show um, I, and what, what kind of previous knowledge you had of Quantum Leap when you joined the series? We um, came to the show uh, right around the time, um, obviously before you know it was starting up. Um, you know, Derek and I obviously know about the show from growing up. Um, Derek was more of a viewer of it than I was. Um, I was in college when the show came out, so I really didn't wasn't watching TV a lot. Um, only caught sporadic episodes here and there, but I know Derek was a big devotee of it. And we had just finished working on our previous show, uh, a CW show called Legacies. And uh, we're kind of looking forward to some downtime, looking forward to some quiet time. You know, we've been working really hard through the pandemic and everything. And, you know, Derek had put in a call to our agents hearing that, oh, this new Quantum Leap series is happening and they may be staffing. So, you know, they put the feelers out. They sent out a sample of ours and uh, we were able to get a meeting with the uh, co-creators, uh, Stephen Lillian and Brian Winbrandt. And obviously Martin Giro, you know, his, his production company read our material and uh, we had a meeting and that's how it began. And Derek, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> well, let me preface by I was excited about it. And, and uh, Ben, it's not that ben I wasn't was, excited. I was just looking well, forward to ben a break. Like, that's well, all. Yeah, but you didn't. I mean, but you like you said, you didn't watch the show. You didn't watch the original series. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't a doctor. I was not a doctor. I was I knew all about the series, you know, uh, and so I was very much like very curious. I wasn't so much excited, but then read the pile of the script and was like, Oh, we definitely should, should take a meeting. Um, and so we met with Brian and Steven who are also a writing team. We just hit it off because it was like, I think it was like one of our first times that we ever had a meeting with like a writing team and a, for a, for a show yeah. uh, that was running a show. So it was like, we had so many like just similarities and we were just like, really, you know, just, you know, simpatico in that, in that way of like, we were like, oh, we walked away from it was like, you know what, even though we said to ourselves that we were going to take some time off and just work on our own things, I was like, we'd be remiss to, you know, uh, not leap at this opportunity. And, and uh, then Unintended. they, and, and they, uh, they, they felt the same way. And we got the uh, offer to come come aboard and and uh, join the show. And so we were right there from the very beginning after um, they had already uh, greenlit the, the pilot that was shot, uh, the, that was originally shot, that eventually became uh, another episode. Because then what happened was that the studios network decided that that wasn't the right way to launch the 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 the. Um, the seat, the first season of this show. And they wanted to, you know, give up everyone a chance to try to figure out another way to do it. And so, and that included like, it was, it was the, the original pilot was shot up in, in Vancouver. And, and so we were, uh, you know, it's told like, Hey, actually everything's going to be shot down here in LA. And so that was another reason why we were excited about like working on a show, because this will be our first show that we've ever had a uh, chance to work on a show that shot here in LA. <laughs> and so it changes everything, you know, like when you, when it's in your backyard, like, uh, literally like less than 15 minutes away from where we live, it's, you know, you need, you're on the lot. That makes a big difference of versus traveling, you know, the air travel hotel and just being someplace else all the time for whenever you're working on your episodes. So we um, went. Yeah, it just all sort of came together and we we're very excited. And so coming coming on board and uh, working with the rest of the staff, then it was just go, go, go from season one all the way up until now, actually. I mean, there was a little we're bit still of downtime. Go, 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 going. Yeah, yeah, we're still going. Yeah, we're still going. Uh, you know, there's a little downtime uh, for about a good five months, uh, but that was uh, for another whole another reason. 
I'm I'm really curious, just kind of um, looking through your journey since that point up to today. I may be putting words into your mouth, so tell me if I've got this wrong. But you you wrote Salvation or Bust. Neither of you are around during the Old West. You wrote a medical drama. I don't believe either of you have personal medical backgrounds. And then we have One Night in Koreatown, which appears to be a more personal story. It's something set in Los Angeles. Is is this episode this week something that is more relatable for you? And if so, why, how, why did that come after two episodes that are maybe pushing the bounds of creativity for, for you both? Well, to give you a little context for the, the different episodes that we mm-hmm. have written. So Salvation or Bust, um, you know, came about uh, right after uh, Brian and Stephen, you know, left and, and Martin, you know, took over in earnest and he really wanted to do a Western. And uh, ironically, the, the spec script that the, everyone read that got us this job was a Western. So it kind of, it, it sort of all fell into place for us there. Um, while we were on set making that episode, the room was breaking episode 10 and we were, you know, we're just working on shooting, shooting Salvation or Bust. And then on the last day, Martin was like, hey, we've got, you know, this episode broken. You guys did such a good job with this one. Would you be willing to write the medical one? And we're like, okay, well, neither of us <laughs> have any expertise in that arena. And, you know, other than having watched like you know, numerous episodes of like ER, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> um, or Grey's Anatomy, you know, and, and he's like, but I think you guys are going to crush it. And we're like, well, okay, now our job is to crush it. So, you know, we always look at any, any story we're given as a challenge. And if it's something, whether it's in our wheelhouse or outside of it, we always look to push ourselves to another plateau of, of our ability. You know, sometimes our reach exceeds our grasp. Sometimes we manage to, you know, stick the landing. And I think with, with that episode, you know, I, I think, you know, I can speak for both of us. I think we're particularly proud of it because, you know, the room did an awesome job of breaking that story and giving us most of the raw material we needed to sort of fine tune things here and there. But when we sat down to actually write it, it, it's funny how you realize the things you have inside you that you didn't know were there. That yes, I, I, I have no medical experience whatsoever, and which is why we tried to keep the the the, the, the schmiants to a minimum, um, and and really sort of focus on the characters and the emotions, which is what this show does so well, which is what the original did, which is what we are the you know the inheritors of that legacy, and we tried to carry that forward. With one night in Koreatown, that's something that we had. There is a much more personal side to it, and and it and it starts with Ray because he's the one that really wanted to do a story set in this time period. And he said it throughout in season one. And so when season two came around, you know, Derek remembered, he'd said that when it came time to pitch out ideas, at the beginning of the season, what do you guys want to do? This was like, okay, we would love to do this one. And, you know, thankfully Martin and Dean said, yes. I have to think Derek as a huge fan of the original. Um, one of the touchstones for me of the legacy series is black on white on fire. Mm-hmm. I can't help but think of of Arf. that when I'm watching One Night in Koreatown. Was that um, an inspiration for you when it came to how you wanted to approach this episode? Yeah, I mean, it definitely was an inspiration, and you know, all credit goes to to Deborah Pratt. That was her episode, and it's a it's a very you know important episode in in Quantum Leap lore. Uh, and, but it was, it was interesting because in that case, it, it, you know, it was like Sam leaps into, uh, uh, the body of a person, you know, that's, that's a black, black man. Right. And, and so it's, it's the, we already walked in those shoes in that story. And it was like, again, you know, having Ray be the star of your show, uh, being Korean American, having the the experiences that Ray has had, you know, living in L.A., being at that time. And I have a lot of friends who also experienced that it was, you know, being also being half Asian. It was very important for us to want to have the Asian Americans POV centered in this in this story. Um, and so and also the other thing is that you don't want to just do what has already been done. Right. And so that with the L.A. Watt, the Watt story, in this case of this with the L.A. uprisings, um, you know, it was it was an it was an opportunity to basically say, OK, 
how to how that was done versus what we want to do here, you know, and make it completely different, but also still be relatable. And and that's what we that's what we um, that was our focus. So, I mean, just to follow up, um, were there any special considerations that you took into when you were trying to figure out the points of view? I mean, for for it to be set in Koreatown, what kind of research did you have to do? And I, I'm just curious to know, like, how you got the characters you got, because you had a fairly wide representation of different types of people. Mm-hmm. And it was also a story that was very um, – very adept at dovetailing into Magic Spack story, which was a nice way to bring the project side into it all. So, yeah. I mean, you had a lot of moving parts that you were thinking of, and I feel like at the heart of it, aside from aside from Ernie and Raymond, was yeah. C.S. Lee. Oh, so, C.S. Lee yeah. was fantastic. Great. He was great, he, and and he was very excited to to embrace this role uh, and and also bring his own experiences and and knowledge. Uh, and bring, you know, breathe that character into life. And and it was very, you know, it was like you know, everybody that came in and, and that, you know, was played uh, from from Danny Kane to Benji Flores to Annalisa. It, they were all fantastic and they brought something, you know, unique and a, and a great POV to those characters in a way that, you know, on when you're on the page, you're, you're, you're hoping that it's all going to work because it's a balancing balancing act. Right. Because you have you have to tell the story that is what the episode's about, but then what's it really about? And then on top of that, still service what Quantum Leap is about. And then, you know, so it's uh, very much a, okay, when we're putting it all together, you know, saying like, okay, what's going on here? How is this tie? How does this tie in, especially with magic, you know? And then when you're writing for Ernie Hudson, again, you know, Ben and I, we can't, sing his praises enough and just also be very excited because we're big fans of his to get a chance to write for him. You want to make sure you want to write something, you know, fun and, and exciting for him. And, and it was, it was a, a great opportunity for, you know, to explore magic a bit more too. So it was, you know, there was a, there was a, a lot of that. And, um, but early on, well, we were just like, OK, let's just make sure that we get this story straight. So there was research. There was also talking to again, like I have a lot of friends that were there. I was not there at the time. I was actually uh, stationed in the military. I was elsewhere, but I was watching it all unfold. And well, with my with my fellow Marines, we were all watching it and wondering, like, how is this going to affect and if it's going to spread in the way that, you know, could possibly you start hearing rumblings and, and also to the point where they had to put us down on lockdown in the base mm-hmm. because they were worried that there might be sort of uprising at the base and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, then it's just, um, just, yeah, just in general of just being in Los Angeles and, you know, uh, uh, also our fantastic director, Tamika Miller, who also was able to bring uh, her unique POV and perspective into this and, and breathe, you know, breathe life into it in a way that just makes it, you know, our, our whole intent was just to try to make this authentic as possible in the given amount of time that we were able to do this episode. <laughs> hmm. I feel like you pulled it off. If that's any uh, consolation to you. No, thank you. <laughs> I, we've, we've touched uh, a couple of times on magic and Ernie Hudson, and I'd love to delve into that a bit more because I think, it's fair to say one of the views that we've had on the podcast ever since day one is you've got a fantastic actor there in Ernie Hudson who is bringing a lot of gravitas to the role, but not doing much apart from asking other characters to explain things. And in this episode, we get this double whammy that we're discovering this new side to him and this 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 weakness that, that he has and that whole plot line that's going to go on and also uh, his his experience with the race riots. And I'm interested in how that came up in the, in the writer's room and how that came up when you were breaking the season. Was there a plan to have him have a a battle with alcoholism that was going to come up at some point? And it just happened that this was the right spot. Or was it that your episode was being written and you realized, Hey, actually there's, there's some things that this could be bringing up. And then the alcoholism came afterwards. I mean, it was a little bit of both. Uh, yes, to sort of both of those answers, like we or questions. Um, we 
we knew we were going to, you know, because we had a three year time gap, we mm-hmm. had to fill it with the lives of what these mm-hmm. people went through. And, you know, Addison's was very clear from, you know, as of episode two, right. Um, magics was, I forget when it came about, but yes, knowing that he was going to be the one going into, into the imaging chamber, you know, being hologram for an episode, we, we, we jumped on that. We're like, okay, this is the perfect chance to sort of dig into it mm-hmm. and, and show the repercussions of those three years on this particular character. Um, being able to tie it into Magic's backstory, you know, during his early days in the military, before Sam ever leapt into him. And, you know, finding that sweet spot window where we're like, oh, the math kind of works mm-hmm. out that he might have been around Detroit at that time. And in, in, in a freaky twist of fate that neither Derek or, nor I were aware of is that Ernie Hudson was actually in Detroit that summer. So he he had personal firsthand life experience with it that was news to us after yeah. we had written those scenes, which was, you know. I mean, it was just like mind blowing. Um, and, and it, and it brought a, another level of personal for him that we were, you know, unaware of, uh, of him as a, as a human being, mm-hmm. as opposed to just the character. Um, so it, yeah, it, I mean, it was a weird serendipity that it worked for, out for us that, that this episode became the crux point for magic and, and the revelation of that, uh, of those three years, what he was going through as well as, um, you know, being able to say, oh, this is the episode where we reveal it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, you know, it's one of those things. It's a storyline. And again, again, I'm not going to spoil where things go, but it is a storyline that our goal with it, as, as with all things on the show, is to sort of present the positive side of things, mm-hmm. right? To show that the hopeful, optimistic side of things. And, uh, you know, the way Ernie did his arc in this episode, the way he, you know, performed it for us, it was just, it was just, it was beautiful. I I must say I I'm really glad I, I I was glad watching the episode and I'm really pleased with the tease that you've given there that maybe this isn't going to go away. Um, I was I was personally very worried when he stepped out of the imaging chamber at the end that he was going to be saying I've exercised my personal demons everything is fine and that that moment where he steps into the elevator and makes the call is just it's it's so beautiful and so true. Um, I won't try and pull any more out of you though, because it sounds like you've, you've already teased a little bit that uh, this is going to come back. I do want to ask one, th- maybe, maybe. Um, well, I mean, listen, part of that, that last moment though, is to honor the truth about what people who struggle with mm-hmm. addictions deal with is that yeah. it's something that they live with. And so, yeah. yeah, it would have been dishonest to be like, I'm good now. Yeah. No, of course right. not. He's, he's still struggling and he's still, it's a process he's got to work through. There's no magic button for magic. <laughs> you know it's uh, <laughs> it it really is and that's also again we again when you come to the authenticity of something like mm-hmm. that especially when you're talking about a topic such as that you really want to make sure that you are respecting it and and also the people that are like as as been said that have been you know impacted whether or not it's them personally or people in their lives and so you know you never want to make it just like okay in 42 minutes we solved that yeah you know, good job. And again, and then also in the in the greater context of, of the this episode, again, that's something else. It was like we never wanted to make, you know, make it seem like that we're solving mm. the issues that are being brought up. Right. Yeah. It's like we're, what we're doing is we're 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 putting what right what went wrong for this this family, this character that Ben leaped into. Absolutely. But that's not mean that we have solved <laughs> the issues yeah. that, you know, that that made that incident happened in the first place or what, you know, brought them together in the first place. Uh, so that's, that was also very, you know, we were very cognizant of that as mm-hmm. we were, as, as just in, in general, whenever we're writing these episodes, all the, the, you know, the, the entire writer's room, uh, everybody is always make, you know, trying to gauge that to make sure that we get some, some of that right. I, I'm going to ask one more specific question about this topic before I let us move on, because this is something and it may be something you don't want to answer or can't answer, but it's been bugging me since uh, watching the episode the first time. Was Magic lying about finding an empty bottle at the back of the pantry? That's for you to decide. Yeah, I thought you might say that. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who says it's empty? <laughs> no, no, it was empty. <laughs> it was empty. <laughs> Well, I, I have to ask, since we're on Magic and we're on the support network that he's built up over the last couple of years since Ben has been gone, um, Derek, as a fan of the Legacy series, mm-hmm. uh, whose idea was it to ship Magic and Beth? And was it a special thrill to be able to write Susan back into the script and to bring so much connective tissue back to Sam and Al and the original? Well, so happy about that. She's She's, wa- she's wonderful. <laughs> And, and, and it was also, it just seemed like that that's the way it was going to go. And it would be a disservice if we didn't actually try to do something with that. Right. It was that it was like, we were dropping those hints in the first season, you know, and it's like, it was kind of there. So it was saying like, well, what else has happened in these people's lives over these last three years since Ben has been Mm -hmm. missing. Right. And, and it was like, this seemed like the most obvious, like, yes, Let's do this. Like, let's, you know. <laughs> I, I, I seem to, I, I, it started, I can tell you when it started. And, and, and I don't think we can take really credit for this. No, I feel like yeah. it was our, it was our, our writer assistant, uh, Annalise, uh, who wrote um, episode 116, which we, you know, Derek and I oversaw the production of. Um, but she's, she's been shipping those two since like <laughs> forever. And, <laughs> And in her episode originally, if you remember when Magic shows up at Ben's mm-hmm. house, um, there was, a, I think in the final edit of it, there was a little less than there was originally. There was a little bit more of a moment between the two of them than what ended up on screen. And that was sort of the, the, the genesis of, well, like, well, okay. This is where we're going to pick, you know, at least we have some like we had written something that like we're not just pulling this out of our out of our asses. Like we're it was based mm-hmm. on something that we collectively decided, let's play that. And even if it didn't make it to air, we were it was it was bubbling. Well, in the it was, background the, it was and, the fun moment when Janice like listen, I said, what's going on with you two? You know, it's like yeah. so yeah. we were like, OK, yeah. that's the moment. Let's yeah. run with that. And, 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 and you know, it just. So it yeah. didn't get shot down. The idea was like, all right, we're going to we're going to keep going with this and see where this goes. So, you know, when you see him buying those the the, the earrings, a, you know, so the, too, yeah. the episode two, you're just like, who are those earrings for? You know, mm-hmm. it's like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, and we've already said this in the main show, Matt. I told you so. I told you so. Oh yeah, I, I know. I, you were Team Meth from the start. I, I did not. Yeah, say that's, it. We've, been, we've been calling them Meth. That's that's the ship name for them. <laughs> and and so a, 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 dub, a double whammy alongside Ernie Hudson, um, Susan Deal, su- such a great performer from the original series, and then yeah. last year. We had a show up. She did some some work, but we we didn't see what she's capable of as a performer until this week's episode, and that was yeah some some great stuff. So another another great opportunity to see a a good actor doing what they do. Well, it's all, I mean again as as someone who came to the original series later, uh, and and you know watched all of it to sort of get caught up to speed. You know, having her. Knowing that 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 Al had there was someone in Al's life that was so important to him, and that person is now in our world. That person is you know just as much an appendage of the show, and I mean that in a, in a positive way. I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, that you want to see their story. You want to you know they they have a perspective on what we do, and because Al was their connection to the world of Quantum Leap it gives us a different point of view than, than all of us who are fans of the team, fans of the place. She's got a very different outlook on quantum leap and the impact quantum leap has on someone's life, which I think is a nice realistic portrayal of, you know, yes, it's great. We show up every week and, and right or wrong, but you know, lives are impacted by what this place is and what it does. And, and it's not always for the better, you know, it's not so Pollyanna and, and, and mm-hmm. rose colored glasses, I think. I think it's it's a great way of, of getting mixing a little bit of gray into the black and white. Um, if I could maybe broaden out a little bit from from the specific episode, I've noticed it was almost broadcast through the character of Neil that season two of the new Quantum Leap almost has a new mandate 
we're going to be doing different kinds of leaps, telling bigger types of stories, different types of adventures. And I'm curious to know, I know that you guys had no hiatus between the end of season one and the beginning of season two, but there is such a marked difference in the feel of the show. And okay, we can use the time jump to sort of explain that, but it just feels like a, a new show. I've said this is almost like the, the third iteration of Quantum Leap to me because season one was, it had, it was just such a different feel. Like I, if you can speak to maybe broader topics, concerns going into season two of where you wanted the show to be and what you wanted to accomplish this season as opposed to last season. I don't know if you had a mandate in the writer's room or I'm just so fascinated by the creative process mm -hmm. because I just see so much more going on this season. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with at the top, starts with the leaders. So, you know, we have our, our showrunners, fantastic showrunners, Martin Garrow. Dean Jajaris, they are, you know, uh, they're the captains of the ship. Right. And and I think when you when you have them at the at the helm, right, it's sort of this idea of coming into season two. We figured out most of the sort of the trouble spots, the things that work that didn't work. And as we roll and then, you know, and, and having the opportunity because we were able to do 18 episodes, you know, it's like you can see the confidence in the storytelling and, you know, growing so that by the time you get to the end of that season, everybody kind of knows what this show is. So then going into season two where we had a roadmap of like, OK, this is what we want to see and this is how we want to do it. We were able to just roll right into it. Um, and so I think it was some more of the, it wasn't so much as a mandate as it was, it was like, okay, how do we top ourselves? How do we keep this going and what works and what hasn't worked? And let's make sure that we keep doing the things that work more than things that don't. And it's still a trial by fire because you just never quite know until you're, you know, it all comes together. Every episode is just sort of because it's so, like you said, it's so different. And that's what makes the, the show so much fun. It's like every week is just a, it's a new treat. It's not, you know, it's never the same sort of story and itself other than the mission and, the, you know, the main character trying to, you know, again, put right what's wrong and trying to find a way back home and the team but you know we it's like you you have that shake up that happens right that 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 happens in from after being 3 years later so all the characters are kind of in very different places uh and you know different starting points and like yeah and, and you're right chris it's very much sort of like almost like a third iteration of like starting again from from you know from 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 uh, from the ground floor well, and, and every, you know, every season arc is different, right? Like very much season one, we were looking to, to really honor and, and homage the, the, the original show, like drawing on things like Leaper X and, you know, the idea that, you know, the, the, the memory forgetting, you know, the spaghetti, the Swiss cheese brain and all that stuff, like, uh, Going into season two, we really, like we we did it. We told the story that we needed to tell that ended up with Ben where he ended up with at the end of the season and set him on the path for the next season. So it's like you can't you can't just keep going back and redoing what you did the first time. You got to kind of push in new directions. And I think yeah, like Derek was saying, the time gap really helped with that. Um, knowing the you know our, our characters and our actors better, we kind of have an, a, a better understanding of you know what what they all can bring to the table and and what we can do with them. Um, as characters, uh, I, 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 but, but the engine remains the same and that's the thing. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you, when the, when the things that you, you did, you're like, okay, well that was cool, but maybe we don't need to do any more of that. That makes way for other things to sort of fill the space and, and put in things that are, it just goes deeper. It's just an opportunity to go deeper with things. And I think, I think this year I feel like with each episode, we've really had a lot more room and depth and we've introduced new elements, right? Which I won't talk more about, but yeah. <laughs> yes. It's okay. We, don't, we all know Tom's the bad guy. We all know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying anything about Tom. We actually haven't, we haven't, we haven't uh, had a chance to be on set with, with, with Peter. Um, you know, five was, uh, he was not in that episode. So mm. our paths are not crossed. 
<laughs> so we don't know. <laughs> he hasn't tried to kill either of us. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good, yet, sign. Yet. Good sign. Good <laughs> yeah. sign. I'm really intrigued, sort of, on that topic, but maybe more broad. Um, obviously, season two went into production so early. Um, you were filming this back in February. I can only assume you were writing it sometime uh, before. With all that time that's passed and the, all the episodes of the end of season one that was a, that, that have aired since... Do you spend a lot of time on social media seeing what the fan reaction is or listening to podcasts or anything? And, okay, have there been any surprises for you with the time that's passed in terms of these first five that have aired as a whole, what the response to them has been? Any particularly big surprises? I mean, you know, we're both on social media. You know, we kind of, we'd love to see what the fans have to say. You know, always curious um, especially when people speculate and have theories is always mm. fun, never going to address them. So don't even ask. <laughs> um, but, uh, it is, it is, um, it's, it is interesting to sort of see what people react to. Um, obviously the big thing now is, you know, the Ben Addison of it all. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge thing, which, you know, our show is part love story. So how they're feeling and responding to the love story means, means a lot to us to know that, that they are having a reaction, whether they love it or hate it. That's it's it's evoking a response, and that that means they're engaged and interested, and that and that's great for us. Yeah, I think the the biggest surprise, uh, the delight is how much people are enjoying this season. I think that's that's mm -hmm. you know it seems like that every week, you you know you're just seeing more people just really enjoying the season, and then also people going back and being able to discover the first season, and really I think there's a, there was the relief of. In the first season of like, OK, is this show working? Is this uh, something that's worth turning, especially, you know, winning over fans who, who were fans of the original series and having, you know, questionable, uh, you know, having those doubts of if this show was just going to be another like sort of cash grab and just not, you know, respecting what came before, you know, if it was really worth tuning in and then surprising everybody. It was like, oh, no, this is a good show. This is, you know, this is a great cast. And I'm in, I'm excited enough to keep watching it. And, and so we had, uh, you know, by shifting us to to being at an earlier time on another day. Also, I think really sort of, you know, gave uh, more people a chance to check the show out. And and now you have even, you know, more fans joining uh, um, the sort of circle of, of where they're really um, tuning in and, and having these discussions and stuff in a way that. Uh, you know, didn't happen in the first season. So I, I think that that's that's been a lot of fun and a nice surprise to see of like and keep running into people like when I talk to them about the show and they're like, oh, I really like that show. Watch that show because you just never know in this in our in our line of work when you're <laughs> you kind of mention the show. People like I don't watch TV. Or, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't I don't watch your kind of TV, <laughs> you know, so but, you know, nine times out of 10, when I say, uh, you know, Quantum Leap, people, oh, yeah, I know that show. I really like that. You know, my family likes that. And that's that's really nice because that's what, you know, at the end of the day, we want to write stories that are entertaining and, you know, for people, for the for the fans, for people, uh, not just for ourselves. So. One thing that struck me over the course of the last five episodes is we see a very definite arc for Ben in the sense that we have the, uh, the premiere episode, um, Matt and I are on record, we, we think it was spectacular because it was so different from the last season. It was just Ben by himself up to his own devices and solving the leap. And then we had the mm -hmm. dropping reveal at the end. Then we had the other side at the project and now things are coming back together. I'm really very curious about when you guys are in the writer's room breaking the season, you know that you have a certain number of episodes and that you want to hit certain goalposts for the characters. I guess all the characters have specific arcs. How do you determine um, where what you're going to pepper in where? Because I felt like in this episode, we saw Ben actually – come to accept the fact that he made a choice that put him in this situation. At first he was mad at Addison for, for not waiting. And then he was just angry at the world for the situation that he's in. And in this one, he tells magic, I made my choice and that's why I'm here. 
And it seems to me like we're seeing like a continual, continual arc, continual growth. We've seen different stuff for Ian and Rachel in the last episode. Now we have some stuff for Magic. So when you guys are breaking the season, do you just have like broad ideas of where you want the characters to be or highlights that you want to hit? And then you sort of weave it into the leaps that you want to tell? Or how does that whole process work? I mean, it's, it starts with the episode order. When you know how many how many you know stories you're going to have to tell and and figuring out the timing of things, um, because our first eight episodes lead you know to a mid season finale, like okay that that right there is a big determinant on the structure of what those first eight episodes are going to be, and obviously along the way you figure out certain things you know you kind of know the beginning and you probably know the end and then the question is what's going to be the middle that gets the character to that point at that end. Um, where our story fell, obviously, was, you know, post a, a big turning point between him and, and Addison. And, and it's funny because, you know, being that this is the second season in a row where we've written the fifth episode, which comes after some sort of romantic reveal between those or a romantic change between those two characters, we've kind of gotten the sweet spot of like, cool, that means we don't have to talk about that particular story. We can sort of put the brakes on it, shift the focus to slightly other things and do some wilder shit. Um, <laughs> But not, not that we don't want to. It's just, you know, better minds sometimes are equipped to tell those stories than we are. And, uh, and, and we're happy to let, you know, those people tell those stories. Um, but in this case, what was interesting to us from the Ben standpoint was, okay, what does life look like post Addison as hologram, right? Like he's, he's already had to face the reality of in the real world back home. Life is without us together. So now here in this life that I'm living right now from leap to leap, I'm on my own. I've got to start over. I've got to have a new beginning. And that that bit of growth for him opens the door to where you'll see the next few episodes go. So it's 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 really um, it really depends. Like I said, it's that starting point of here are our numbers then our numbers determine how creative we get with them and where things happen. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the, uh, the the arc that is progressing up to the mid-season point. Um, are you guys starting now to look with the writer strike now over and the actor strike hopefully coming towards some sort of conclusion? Are you as a team starting to look at, uh, at what you might be filming next? Um, I will say that we, the day after the, uh, the strike ended, we were back pretty much practically back in the room, picking up right where we left off because we had, when the strike first started, um, we were working on six, seven, and eight at that point in time. Um, and so eight shooting, was the shooting last those. shooting, shooting those. So it was like eight was the last episode that, that had a script that was ready to be shot and improved. And, you know, it was, so we were able to get those eight in. And then, um, at that point, those eight are the ones that are airing currently right now. So mm-hmm. we are now working on the next episode you know a couple episodes um getting getting those ready and we hit the ground running so we're we're already trying to figure you know we've we've been talking and figuring out like the rest of the season of what's going on um and like i said fingers crossed that the actors you know they've been out there every day they were out there every day with us when when they came in i think they came and joined us around day 80 of our strike 80 something Mm -hmm. and uh so, you know, like hopefully they get a, a, a great deal and, you know, maybe this will be a different story in a, in a week from now um, of, of where where things are going. Because uh, we're yeah, it's like it's very much an interesting sort of thing of coming back in, figuring these stories out. But the problem is you get to a certain point where mm-hmm. you don't have actors. So. <laughs> What, you know, what do you do and how do you, you know, it's like, so you have to sort of plan accordingly. But as the writers, you know, we're just our plan. I mean, you know, our goal and mission is to figure out the rest of the season, uh, make sure that tracks. And so coming back into it, we were able again to sort of have that 
sort of unique opportunity to say like, okay, those first first eight episodes that we did this season, these are things that we're working. This is stuff, but you know, there's other things that we need to figure out and we need to make sure that we figure out going forward. Um, So like without getting into it, you know, without spoiling anything, there are definitely storylines that you have to sort of like lay out, But if they're not tracking, then, you know, Mm -hmm. this is where you have to sort of like get get it, you know, get it right before you start (laughs) putting putting stuff out. So that's where that's where we are right now. All the writers, we're just we're just working. We're happy to be back at work. We're happy, you know, so happy to be just working on the show again. And uh, hopefully everyone else will be able to come back and then Mm -hmm. we'll be able to keep up making uh, fun stuff happening. We all hope so. And I, I think I'm kind of going to ask the inverse of the question I asked earlier. Um, this this break, one of the things that it's uh, afforded you is, I guess you're, you're going in now to look at these episodes, which will hopefully make up the back half of the season, having seen how the first four or five episodes are responded to on social media. So is the fan reaction likely to have more of an impact than normal on those back episodes? Since I guess you'd normally have been going in planning out thirteen up front. Yeah, I mean it. it you you can't just say, "Oh, the fans don't want us to do something, so we shouldn't mm. do it." That's that's not you know that's not really how it works. Uh, like I said, it's something we always take into account how people react to things, and if something were you know egregious maybe you you course correct but Mm. based on response but we're you know there's a certain logic to what what flows from what you've set up Mm. and you have to honor that story um and we as a room have been have done our diligence for these characters in the season and knowing where we want it to go and how we want it to end we've we've known that since we started talking about this season so all we can hope for is that the fan reaction is 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 positive, and 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 in the places where it's negative, that's not something we can control. You mm-hmm. know, like that's something you know we, we respect it, and everyone certainly has the right to 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 disagree with stuff. We hope they don't. When they when they love what we do, it's is incredibly gratifying. Um, we always want that. You know, <laughs> we're, we're writers. We, we love positive feedback. Nobody likes <laughs> negative feedback. But, uh, you know, at, at the same time, you know, we, we exist as, as the writing staff in service of the show and the characters and, and, and telling the best possible version of their adventures that we can. Great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. It, it, I guess it, it's such a weird time to be a writer because I think – Historically, writers have written in a vacuum in the sense that it was your show, you were in the room with your team, and you did what you did, and maybe you got a letter or something. And now you can watch in real time as people react to your show, and maybe you're not even done with the season. And does it does it mess with your head in the sense that, well, we thought we had something good here. Do we have to, do we have to pivot? Do we have to course correct or whatever? And maybe there's a little bit of that, but staying true to the vision. If, if I can say you know anything about this season, it seems like... I guess that difference I was talking about, it. it's a much more character-focused, emotionally honest show, I think, than the plot-driven focus that we saw in the first season. And I feel like it's much more akin to the original series, honestly, this season than it was in the first mm-hmm. season because it was a different type of show. But but I get it. I feel like the, the Leap and the project stuff is being much better balanced this season. And that being said, this is a long way t- for me to wind you up to... Now, Benjamin, you've seen the original series. You've gone back and watched it. Derek, you're a Died in the Wolf fan. Are there other elements or aspects of the Legacy series that you hope that you might be able to incorporate? Or if you had, like, a, you know, a wish come true? Besides Scott coming back, because, you know, we know that's out of everybody's control. But are there any elements of, of the original that you feel like you, you would like to incorporate a little bit more? Glowing heels. <laughs> We'll take them. Yes. <laughs> Get Jean Pierre on the phone. <laughs> wow, that that's a good reference. Thank you. Yeah. All right. See, did my homework. Uh, no, I mean, you know, 
I think the evil leaper was the one that kind of scratched that itch for me where it was like it was just so much fun uh i wish maybe that maybe we might have been able to do a little bit more figuring mm-hmm. some things out but you know it kind of worked out the way it did um no i think you know there's 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 some other things that maybe that might but i i'm, I'm gonna hold off right now <laughs> that i can think of like <laughs> Um. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, yeah. I was like thinking. Um, yeah, there's 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 one thing I definitely want want to do, but that that will be for another conversation that's not yet ready. So let's <laughs> go back to that. <laughs> you got it. I I don't want you to pitch your ideas right here to us on. on yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's like, that's all like that. that. <laughs> In the in the magic eight ball, signs hazy. Ask again later. You got it. You got it. I just I, I know all the fans when when they hear that there are fellow fans that mm-hmm. are actually writing the show. You know, <laughs> you yeah. feel like it becomes like an, uh, the snake eating its own tail, right? Do they call it oral sure. Yes. Yes. So yeah, yeah, you you got to know where to draw that line, and I was just getting a little geeky there. Yeah, there'll, yeah. <laughs> there'll be a moment some years from now where we'll all be watching TV, and all the fans will sit up and say, "That's what Derek meant." <laughs> <laughs> Keep an eye out for it. Um, Ben, Derek, uh, you've you've given us a fantastic insight into uh, what's happening in season two, and some really great teases for what might be coming up. Uh, is is there any final words you want to share with the, the listeners about One Night in Koreatown or the next few episodes that, that we've got to look forward to? I mean, I'd just like to say thank, say thank you all for watching. Um, it, it means so much to us to know that you guys care as much as you care about the show and these characters. Um, and, you know, we, we always value your feedback and we always want to hear from you and love it or hate it. You know, you're you're the fans, and and you know we are all in this together. Yeah, it's like it's just so it's just so great that you know people have been enjoying the show and all, especially after all this time that when we've been putting all this work into it, uh, you know, from from the cast to the crew, just incredible amount of work that was happening because we they had no breaks; they would just went rolled right into season two to try to get ahead, and so that you have these eight episodes. Um, and, and, you know, to see it all pay out, you know, pay off in the same, in this way, like for us, one night in Koreatown, we didn't get to see a, a, a cut of this until three weeks ago. I, and it was like, we had to wait until the strike came to an end for us to be able to jump back in and see everything that we worked on, you know, it's like, so it was, it was a rediscovery. And so to see it all come together. Uh, it was just be, you know, I think that I speak for Ben as well, that we're very proud of this episode. We're very proud and, and just very proud and happy and, and grateful to be working on this show in general. It's just, it's been such a, a, a great experience for us. And we will, and so we hope that it's been a great viewing experience for everyone else. And so just, uh, stay tuned and keep watching because there's more to come. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, you absolutely should be proud of this week's episode. And uh, yeah, I think the, the fans are all grateful for these eight and optimistic for more around the corner. So we're thank, sure, we're sure. thank you so much for your for everything you've done and for your time today. No, thank you, guys. We had a lot of fun. This was great. We really appreciate you when you're reaching out. So thanks so much. <laughs>